So I'm going to try meditation too. The first thing I asked about was the title. So what, is, what is the title of this meditation? Tell us. Say what you're doing. Um, concerning the nature of the human mind, that it is better known than the body. The knowledge of the mind, knowledge I have of my mind, is more certain than the knowledge that I have of my body. This is actually quite important because if I'm prioritizing the senses as my foundation, as Aristotle in the older tradition would do, and how do you begin to know things? Well, from the time you're a baby, you begin experiencing and sensing things. That's the beginning of all knowledge, it was the old theory. Descartes is going to say instead, it's this thought inside my mind which is more certain and less subject to deception and error than the knowledge outside of my mind. Which means I'm going to start here, and on the basis of conclusions I draw about my mind, I'm going to then reach some kind of knowledge about my body. So, first thing is going to argue about in this meditation the nature of the mind and the body, and the nature of the mind is such that we know it better than we know the mind, than we know the body. So, he, gets, he brings us back to the point at which he left meditation two. Meditation two, you recollect, we finished with complete doubt. We had found ourselves, we worked ourselves into the situation of contemplating the possibility of an evil demon. An evil demon, I said, it's kind of an epistemological nuclear weapon. There's no way of escaping the evil demon's deceptive power. A being with infinite power can act on me to cause me to make whatever errors he wishes. It looks like I have no hope of ever having certainty about anything. Just have everything I know, I'll have to say, well, provided the evil demon isn't deceiving me right now, I think the bus is here one time. Provided the evil demon isn't deceiving me, I'm pretty sure I have five fingers on my hand, etc. Now, how do we escape from the evil demon? Well, this is what we get at the beginning of meditation too. Just remember that in bed one, we began with a mixture of true and false beliefs with no sure method of telling between them. Then Descartes went through this process of reasoning of radical doubt, we call the three Ds, the deception of the senses, and therefore I have set all of those aside, uh, the dream experiences which we have to set aside by the, the bare existence of my body, and then the possibility of the evil demon which needs to be set aside, even the analytical sciences and the abstract reasoning of mathematics, the evil demon would make me get two and three, two plus two or two plus three wrong every single time because it's infinite power. He just intervenes to cause me to go wrong while thinking I'm going right. We're getting down to the thing that is proof against all three of these, the thing I can't falsely dream, the thing I can't be deceived about, and the thing that not even the evil demon can uh, cause me to get wrong, is the reality of I think, or I am thinking. I am thinking right now. That's a fact that if the evil demon wishes to fool me, he has to allow that fact to exist. He has to allow that fact to take place. Moving forward, so he goes on and says, I'm going to therefore suppose everything that I see is false. He's reminding us that however we get out of this, it's not going to be by the senses, it's not going to be by our memories. I've already denied that I have any senses, that I have a body, at the bottom of page 63. I've persuaded myself, at the bottom of 63, that there's absolutely nothing in the world, no sky, no earth, no minds, and no bodies. Is it then the case that I, too, do not exist? Right, you see the beginning of the turn here. But doubtless I did exist, if I persuaded myself of something. But is there some deceiver, who's supremely powerful, who's always dedicated to deliberately deceiving me, then too there would be no doubt that I exist, since then he would be deceiving me. And let him do his best in deception, he will never bring it about that I am nothing, so long as I shall think that I am something. This I think is indubitable because it's self-validating. Every time I think it, it becomes true. Thinking it makes it true. That's not the case with any other foundational statement that I could get, like my senses are reliable, or I'm seeing yellow right now, or anything like that. Those things all could be mistaken. Thinking them doesn't make them true. But thinking, I think, causes it to be true. So my next point here, what are his reasons for rejecting the definition of rational animal? So I know that I exist, I think, that we get to, I exist, I exist, but what am I? What is this thing that exists? I exist, but what am I? Right, I'm not a rational animal. That's the standard answer from Aristotle forward. Human beings are 
right. of the genus animal, there's specific differences in rationality. So that the, the animal that is rational would be sort of classified as. Why not? Uh, because he said that if you would have to like ask what animal and rational are, then that would take too long. Not just that it would take too long, but how would I know? How do I know what those words mean? Senses. I got that information from the senses. And I've already set those aside. I can't use those. That tool is not in my toolbox anymore. So if I'm going to pull myself up out of this pit to figure out what I am as a, as a basis for going forward, I'm going to have to reason my way out without using the concept of rational or animal. These are going to be unknown to me except through my senses. It's only with my senses that I'll be able to know what rational means and what animal means. It's actually going to raise the question, what is his conceptual vocabulary? What are the tools that are left in his toolbox? He gave up all of his memories, all of his senses, everything he's ever learned through contact with any other human being ever. And even if God spoke to him, presumably he has to remember what God told him, and then he's back into the trap of remembering the memory of an experience, and that could be deceptive, the evil demon could be up there. So if these things are unknown, what do we say then? How does he go forward? Let's read this, middle of page 64. Now, uh, let's see. Nor do I have enough free time, this is what you were talking about, free, right? To waste on subtleties like this. Instead, permit me to focus here on what came spontaneously and naturally into my thinking whenever I pondered what I was. I think this is important. What's his method here? It's not to say, let me consult the wisdom of the ancients, or let me examine what the finest minds in philosophical history, Aristotle, Plato, or somebody more recent, my own Jesuit school masters at the University of Paris, let me consult what they think and decide whether I agree or disagree in part or in full. So that, let me set all of that aside as being much too subtle and abstract and, and you know, ivory tower, pointy head, uh, elite intellectual. Let me think of the common man that I was praising at the beginning of this text and in the discourse. Right? The ordinary guy who's just got a fair share of common sense. Let me reason like that guy and just notice what spontaneously comes into my mind whenever I think about myself and my thought. What's his method here? What's the source of authority for his method? It's not tradition, not connection to some sort of authoritative text or school of thought. What is it? What's going to be the basis for his trusting what conclusions he comes to? Brief. His thought process? His own reflective thought process. We've got here the kind of uh, that common sense idea from the beginning now made into his main method. I'm just going to pay careful attention to what happens in my mind when I think clearly about this in my isolated scope. So his method here is going to involve reflection rather than any sort of appeal to or interpretation of or just extension in and participation in a tradition. Rather than thinking he's going to be starting over, starting over on the basis of his own subjective experience. 